All right, why don't we get started? Um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming today. Um, I know this isn't probably the most technical uh, presentation of the conference, but I hope you guys get some useful information. Uh, my name is Steve Bachman. I am a patent attorney. I've been a patent attorney in the Bay Area for about 20 years. I've worked with all sorts of companies. I've worked with Fortune 500 companies. I've worked with startup companies. Uh, and over my career, I have tend to have uh, developed a specialty um, kind of focus in many different areas. And one of my uh, key specialties is storage uh, network technology. So I've worked with Panasonic, Dell, uh, SGI, as well as many uh, smaller companies, some startup companies. So I have a fair amount of experience, and I'm uh, happy to share that information from all that experience with you guys today. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about some of the boring stuff, kind of the patentability requirements. Uh, what's generally required for uh, something to be patentable? Uh, we'll t look at the, the US laws, some of the differences between US and foreign laws, and also, you know, is it even the best choice to patent something? You know, sometimes it makes much more sense just to keep it a secret as a trade secret. So we'll briefly talk about some of those differences as well. Um, then we'll look at <clears throat> some of uh, the information about storage technology, hardware and software patents. Kind of what is uh, a good candidate for a hardware patent or s software patent in storage technology? Um, <clears throat> what you should look for uh, in some of the emerging trends in uh, protecting hardware and software in storage technology. We'll then look at some of the patent trends that are happening right now in storage technology. And then we'll just kind of go into some of the IP practices of the industry leading uh, storage technology companies. So this is, these are some like tips and pitfalls that I've uh, implemented and learned uh, over the years and that I know uh, a lot of these bigger companies do just to make sure they get the most value out of implementing their, uh, their patent program. So let's take a look at the, the requirements for a US patent. So a US patent needs to be novel, non-obvious, <clears throat> it needs to be patentable subject matter. So the, the novel or new requirement is pretty straightforward. Almost anything an inventor comes up is probably going to be new because they invented it because they, they can't find a solution anywhere else. Um, for something to be new, there just must not be anything exactly like it. So the non-obvious part is a little bit more tricky. So an invention is considered non-obvious in light of the prior art, which is other inventions or published information, uh, by anyone skilled in the art. <clears throat> uh, most, uh, in most cases, the, the, one of the key questions asked is, was the invention obvious to try in light of what's already out there? So it, it's, it's a very gray area, and it's, although it's supposed to be objective, it's, it's subjective. You know, what's obvious to someone isn't obvious to somebody else. Some questions to ask are, you know, what is the level of an ordinary skill, a person of ordinary skill in the art? Is it uh, somebody maybe out of college a couple of years? Is that the person who would, who would address this problem? Or is it, you know, maybe a, a CTO with 15 years experience who's, you know, an expert in, you know, semiconductor in this particular type of technology? You know, these are all different factors to consider. You know, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but this is just one of the requirements to think about uh, <clears throat> when you're deciding whether or not to move forward with a patent. And then your invention, an invention would need to be patentable subject matter. So for patentable subject matter, it needs to be a process, a machine, or a composition of matter, or a, pros, uh, or a product made by a process. Um, hardware is, is very easy. If, I mean, if you can hold it, or touch it, or manufacture it, it's, it's patentable subject matter. It's, it's an apparatus, uh, or a composition of matter. Software is where this uh, issue really comes into play, because it, there, there was a... Uh, <clears throat> a case that really questions software patents uh, based on whether or not they're patentable subject matter. And we'll get into that in a little bit more, in more detail in a little bit. So let's take a quick look at US patent laws and foreign patent laws, the differences between them. So US patent laws <clears throat> in 2014 recently came into line with foreign patent laws in that it's the first to file. So if two people invent uh, the same invention, no matter, and they did it completely independently, no matter when the first one invented and when the second person invented. A first person may have invented something you know, six months or a year before another person invented it. If another person didn't copy them but invented it on their own and beat them to the patent office, they have the rights to that patent. If the person who invented prior implements that invention uh, on their own and doesn't release it to the public, then that is a defense 
if they're sued by the person who later files for the patent and gets it, but they have to be actually using it commercially in order to uh, have that defense. And that defense only applies to them. It doesn't, so if, if, if person A invents earlier, then person B invents later, and person B sues somebody else, a defense to somebody else can't be, well, somebody else already invented it. Um, you know, as, as long as the, the, the first person goes to the patent office, as long as all the other uh, elements are met, they <coughs> have the rights to that patent. Um, US, uh, foreign patents are a little bit more expensive. Uh, once you file a patent in a foreign country, you have to pay annual annuities, which add up after a while, especially if you have many patents. And uh, you have to be very careful about making your uh, invention publicly known if you intend to file for foreign patent protection. In the United States, if you make something public, you still have 12 months to file for a patent. However, you want to be aware because if somebody else beats you to the patent office, they'll have the rights to that uh, invention. You know, you might be able to prove that uh, they, you know, they copied it from you, but still, that's going to take money and lawyers and things like that. So it's it's you have 12 months to file, but it's advisable that you get it done as soon as possible. In foreign countries, once something is made public, it's typically not patentable in that country. And it's not every country that does that, but it's, it's pretty much every country in the European Union. It's China, Russia, uh, Taiwan, Japan, Australia. Any company that would be economically desirable for you know, a sophisticated product is, has that rule. And by the way, as we go, if anybody has any questions, we can you know, just raise your hand and we can address them uh, as we go. So there are some differences between US patent laws and foreign patent laws. <clears throat> but do you always want to file for a patent? Probably not. Uh, <clears throat> the patents keep me in business. But uh, for you to, to do the best thing for your businesses, it might make better sense to keep something as a trade secret. Uh, <clears throat> You might want to consider patent if, you know, under these factors that I listed up here. If it meets all the legal requirements, uh, if you can detect when somebody's going to copy it, um, if it's going to be, you know, potentially used or valuable during the, the portion of a patent, which is uh, <clears throat> 20, 20 years from the time you file it, and is it going to um, be okay if it's published? You know, if, if somebody does, because once a patent is issued, it is published. And most patents are published 18 months after you file them. So if it's, you know, your secret sauce, you know, for software, or if it's, you know, the, the inner workings of some component or IC or semiconductor that you really don't want to disclose to the public because they won't be able to figure out and they'll be able to, you know, you'll just be able to stay ahead of the competition, then that's the reason you may not want a patent if you really want to keep it secret. Also, if it's something that's going to have a useful life of maybe just a year or a year and a half before you know, things are going to change and it's going to be outdated within a year, or it's going to be valuable for you know, 30 years, 40 years, you may not want to patent it then uh, just because you might want to keep it a secret for those reasons as well. <clears throat> if you do want to maintain a tra tra trade secret, there's some certain things you need to do. It's all uh, internal, but you need to keep records. You need to inform your attorneys it's going to be secret. If anybody's interested in learning more about trade secret program, let me know. I can give you more information later. All right, so let's talk about hardware patents. <clears throat> so what hardware should storage technology companies consider patenting? Well, as we mentioned before, uh, components, chips, systems, and you know, a product that's made by a process that meets the patentability requirements. This can include uh, <clears throat> You know, flash arrays, you know, server, you know, the whole server boxes, the individual drives, uh, you know, systems as, as, a, as a whole, you know, anything that's physical and meets those patent requirements and you think might be valuable and it's okay to eventually publish might be a good candidate to, to make <clears throat> uh, subject to a patent application or patent protection. You also only want to uh, move forward with patents that are valuable to a company and that a competitor might uh, try and copy. Um, <clears throat> patent applications and implementing a patent program can be expensive. Uh, and <clears throat> so you want to make sure you really pick and choose what's really going to be valuable to your company for whatever reason, whether it's uh, to <clears throat> have a, a patent that prevents competitors from of obtain your, your content or uh, you know, other, you know, for some reason that product is valuable to the company. 
Another thing to consider is <clears throat> where you manufacture it. Uh, I've had many clients that have you know, their, their parts manufactured in you know, uh, a manufacturing plant in China, and it's very common for uh, these plants to mysteriously shut down and reopen you know, just down the block. Same people, same technology, uh, same everything, and just you know, start making these things on their own uh, <clears throat> yeah, and, and just sell them to the highest bidder. Uh, contracts help a lot. Long-term contracts help better. But something that, e that helps out even more is if you at least have a patent pending in that foreign country, that it will help keep them in check. Another reason uh, to potentially consider patent something is not necessarily you're going to use it against someone, but if you have somebody in your industry that's uh, particularly litigious, you know, someone that is you know, known for suing competitors to try and stop uh, their products or even put them out of business, you might want to consider a patent for defensive purposes. Uh, not necessarily the shield to go after, or the sword to go after someone, but the shield to protect yourself. Um, in that case, if, you, know, you might consider, well, we have this, uh, we have this flash ray that we're doing um, that's <clears throat> novel for these reasons. We think you know, they might be doing something similar, but with a few tweaks. You don't have to implement an exact technology to patent it. If you can conceive it, uh, and write it, you know, describe it in a patent invention, that's all you need to do. As long as someone skilled in the art, you know, another engineer or CTO or whoever the person would be, can read the application and uh, <clears throat> build the, that uh, device or component, whatever it is, with just a little bit of experimentation, that's enough to enable uh, that patent ap application to be uh, valid. So we'll talk a little bit about that more later, but Patents for a defensive purpose can sometimes be just as valuable uh, than as patents for offensive purpose. And then I have one more bonus one that I actually didn't make a slide on, um, <clears throat> but and this probably applies more to uh, smaller companies rather than larger companies. But if you're a startup or medium-sized company and your eventual exit is you want to be acquired by another company, let's say you want to be acquired by uh, Samsung or some other foreign country, then it can often look much more attractive to that company if you have at least a patent pending in the country of that company. So if you want to be acquired by Nokia, you, you might want to have a patent in South Korea. If you want to be acquired by Samsung, you, you, you might want to be, you know, or Sony, you might be, want to have a patent in you know, Japan or wherever they're located. So. All right, so what software should storage technology companies consider patenting? Uh, again, it's, it's one that meets all the requirements, and we'll get into those uh, the, the patentable subject matter issue in a little bit. But it can basically be anything. It can be you know, <clears throat> internal you know, code on a, on a component. It can be software that runs on a computing device or the, you know, that operates in a controller. It can be something that controls you know, an overall distributed system, you know, the software that's maybe on a server or even on multiple servers and communicates back and forth and, and you know, handles different types of, of uh, <clears throat> you know, storage uh, systems or devices. You know, it can be as, as, uh, you know, as narrow or as wide as you want. Um, examples, so software-defined storage, uh, artificial intelligence for data centers, virtual server environments, uh, automated tiered storage. It, it can potentially be uh, <clears throat> you know, a very broad area of, of software. But, Software has recently come kind of under the microscope as to whether or not it's patentable um, based on the Supreme Court case, Alice Corp versus CLS Bank. Uh, and this case in particular involved an escrow service. So typically when you buy a house, uh, the buyer and the seller, they go, at least when you, unless you're doing it with these guys, uh, you, you go to an escrow and say, hey, we, you know, we're looking to buy a house. Will you be our escrow agent? You give everything to the escrow agents. They make sure everything's in place. They transfer the money. They act as a third, like a third party just to, to make sure the transaction goes smoothly. What CLS Bank International uh, wanted to do was just automate that as a web service. So the, the, instead of going into a physical office, you can just have an escrow agent over the web do it. And so you submit everything to the web service. They would handle everything and then uh, provide notifications and handle the money transfers that way. You would never meet with a physical person. And the Supreme Court found that that was just a computer implemented process of something that's been around a long time. There's nothing particularly new to it other than that it's over the web instead of in person. So they deemed it uh, unpatentable. It received lots of media attention. Um, 
but it didn't necessarily mean the end of software patents. It just kind of specified you know, some of the detail that they required. So let's take a look at that, a little bit more information. Um, <clears throat> so it basically, gener and I won't, I know this is boring. <laughs> uh, we'll just spend a little bit, okay, we'll, we'll just spend a little bit of time because it just kind of lays the foundation of what I'm gonna talk about next. So basically, for the, the test for, you know, is software patentable, there's a two-part test. Uh, first of all, are claims directed towards a judicial exception to patentable subject matter? So as we talked about before, patents need to be new, non-obvious, and they need to be patentable subject matter. Courts have found that some things that are not patentable subject matter, which would be an exception to that, are uh, pure algorithms, you know, just the algorithm in itself, not tied to any application, uh, laws of nature, like gravity, you know, magnetism in general, <clears throat> you know, wind, you know, things that occur naturally in nature, and abstract ideas. So if you just have an abstract idea and it's not implemented in anything in particular, then that's not patentable. So for software, if it's implemented, uh, or if it's claimed, if the patent application describes that the invention you want to protect is an abstract idea, then it's not patentable unless the claims in the patent application amount to significantly more. So the claims in the patent application have to claim something that is significantly more than an abstract idea. Many things have come out uh, since then that are definitely considered an abstract idea. And so all these, here are some uh, categories and examples of things that are uh, abstract ideas. So playing a game by hand, bingo, uh, or you know, poker. You know, th those are fun websites, but you know, to play poker or bingo over the web is not patentable. Uh, meal planning for a diet plan, that's been done for a long time. Uh, electronic escrow services, hedging, uh, advertisements before desired content, all those things have been around a long time, so that the general notion of those ideas are not patentable in and of themselves uh, when they're just uh, done by a computer. With respect to getting a little bit closer to storage technology, <clears throat> uh, there was a case, Smart Systems Innovations versus Chicago Transit, where in the collection and storage and recognition of data did not pr improve on the existing techn technological process, so that was considered not patentable. So several cases have come out uh, in relates to technology that have further uh, kind of clarified what is an abstract idea and what is significantly more. And so I don't want to go over case law too much, but here are some four key cases that have found that uh, technology, uh, some cases related to storage technology, some not, but all of them can kind of be used as a guideline uh, that where software is patentable. So if it's if the invention is something that's rooted in computer technology to overcome a challenge, um, if it's a specific improvement of a computer functionality or operation, uh, if it's non-conventional step or arrangement of pieces uh, put together in a, in a novel way, or if, the, if the, the process to automate something is different than any prior process and improves the technology. So how does this relate to storage technology? Well, storage technology, a lot of that is memory. So any invention that relates to memory, uh, if it's software-based, if it makes you know, faster read times, uh, more efficient, uh, you know, power-saving uh, uh, processes, um, you know, more condensed, you know, even safer if there's uh, you know, methods for uh, encoding data, um, th those types of software are, are very likely patentable. Other types of software inventions can be patentable as well, <clears throat> but they, they, these are the four uh, key guidelines that we would use to determine, you know, would it fit under this? Is it, is it a, something that's rooted in computer technology? Um, you know, memory is. Uh, it's, <clears throat> you know, memory wasn't available, you know, wasn't relevant or existing before computers, so it's, it's very likely that if you have software that meets the, the other three requirements, it's new and it's novel, then, for many of those uh, storage technology innovations, especially with regards to memory, it's probably gonna be rooted in computer technology and there's gonna be a good chance that it's gonna be something that's patentable. Not everything would be, but uh, s software in storage technology is probably one that's more likely to be patentable than other technologies. So that said, um, the law has changed about I think it was 2014, so it's been about four years. Lots of cases have come down. Uh, people who have been in the industry a long time like me have seen what works and what doesn't work, and this is what I would, this, this is like, this is the, the cheat sheet slide 
uh, for, for anyone that's you know, looking at patent applications. Um, draft the applications to include as much technical deal, detail as possible. A lot of the times uh, when the patent office says that something is an abstract idea and doesn't amount to signif significantly more, what oftentimes what you need to do is just include more details about you know, software architecture, like you know, this module you know, calculates something and gives it to another module, or the data is here, you know, it's, it's stored and then retrieved more quickly. You know, that detail you add to the claims, it has to be in the specification first. So when you write that patent application, you want that, you'd rather have too much information than not enough. In, in the application that you file. And then as I mentioned, when you draft the claims, you, know, you need, it can't be just, uh, there's no high level broad claims anymore that are gonna get through the patent office after this uh, subject matter requirement initiated by Alice. So you need to include more details maybe about the data flow, interaction with so software in particular hardware elements, um, you know, reference you know, code modules that do certain things or where they're located. Those are the things that are gonna make it a claim amount to significantly more and therefore more likely to be patentable subject matter. And then, <clears throat> of course, the application and claims should relate to computer technology. It's kind of a given for a lot of storage technology because it's, it's generally done for computers, but it's just something to keep in mind. Any questions on software patents before we uh, move forward to trends? So now we'll look at uh, some trends in software technology patents. Um, it's a pretty small uh, graph I came up with, but I think the slides are available online if you want to take a look at it. But basically what it shows is I looked at uh, Micron, Western Digital, Seagate, Dell, and NetApp. Um, <clears throat> Micron is the red line at the top. They by far have the most patent applications filed and uh, <clears throat> with respect to the other companies. Most of the companies st have stayed pretty steady regarding the numbers of applications they've filed. Um, Seagate rose a little bit in 2014 and then has decreased a little bit this year. Uh, NetApp decreased a little bit, but then has increased a little bit last year. Uh, the only one thing significant change is Micron, which reduced uh, from nearly 1,000 patent applications filed in 2014 to se about 700 in 2018. But otherwise, uh, all these bigger companies are uh, filing you know, pretty significant number of patent applications and maintaining that pattern over the last, last five years. So one question, another question I get very often with storage companies is what should I patent? You know, what is like the emerging technologies? <clears throat> well, when I worked with some of these bigger companies, uh, you know, a lot of things that they were focusing were, were some of these things. You know, all flash storage, virtual server environments, uh, business analytics and software defined storage. But the truth is, you know, the innovations are happening, you know, in all parts, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the read times, you know, the, you know, how compact the data is, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, reducing loss, you know, be you know, between, you know, transmissions. So, so you know, there are some areas that are up and coming and, you know, th those kind of get, you know, the, you know, those are the ones in lights right now, but there's really innovation in all, all areas uh, of, you know, software-related um, and hardware-related storage technology just to continue to make uh, products better and more attractive and faster and cheaper. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, the, the trend is that innovation is it's just a very, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an area with a lot of change, a lot of development, and a lot of competition, so there's always been a drive for more uh, improvements in technology. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some of the IP practices I've seen and implemented and as well I know that are also going on in some of the top storage uh, technology companies. So first of all, keep patent applications as broad as possible. So typically when the, the process for you know, identifying and moving forward with the patent application is uh, a company will, an inventor will come up with an idea that improves something they do or you know, solves a need that a, a client has asked for and they have this idea that nobody's done before and it makes their product better or solves what the client is asking for for their, for their system. So they, they have this <clears throat> idea and everyone says, that's great, let's patent it. Um, but what a lot of companies are doing now, what I've always recommended to my clients is describe something bigger. So that you're, you're identifying, the inventor identified how they do it for this product, maybe for this potential client or actual client. How would a competitor do this? How would you know, the competitor implement this in their product? Uh, how would, <clears throat> you know, what's another way for doing it? 
or you know the the, comp the, the client had this one uh, you know set of requirements. If they you know tweak those requirements a little bit, could this invention be broadened or tweaked a little bit to <clears throat> to uh, you know satisfy that request? Also, the, the inventor usually you know has a budget, a timeline. Okay, this is what we came up with to you know for this product. If he had all the time in the in the world and the company had all the money in the world, what would be on the wish list for that uh, invention? You know, yes, you're, let's say you're doing it, you know, for this particular uh, format. You know, are there other formats or other technologies or other standards that you might be able to implement that in? You know, what what would be the wish list? What if, if you can make it? If you had more time, what else would you implement this? But you just don't have time now. Again, you you don't have to have a prototype to patent something. You just have to invent it in enough detail so that another engineer could reasonably implement it with a little bit of experimentation. And then, like I said, uh, you know, the competitors, how would they do it? Whether it's just that product itself or with the wish list? You know, would they tweak it a little bit? So. You have your core invention. You want to try and make the scope of the patent application bigger than that core invention and hopefully also capture a little bit of how a competitor might do it so that <clears throat> you, know, you can protect your technology, uh, potentially use it against the competitor if they implement in their product, but also you know, if they just are going to do it anyways or maybe in a little different way, you have this defensive um, patent that you might be able to use against a competitor if they ever come after you. So. In short, keep the applications as broad as possible. Also, you want to focus on software, if it's a software innovation, that meets the allowable uh, subject matter requirements. So rooting computer technology, an improvement or of the functionality or operation of the computer, and so forth. So this may or may not be implemented. Does anyone here actually been involved in a patent or a patent application before? Good. So as you know, you, you spend time with the patent attorney or, or you draft it yourself. Then you file the application and the U.S. Patent Office will get back to you. Uh, with a hardware patent, the, the wait right now is about 8 to 12 months. With a software patent, uh, you're lucky if you hear back from them within two years. It's a very uh, big backlog they have right now. But in any case, a, a patent office examiner will examine the case and write an office action, kind of describing this is what we think is okay, this is what we rejected on, uh, and so forth. It makes a world of difference to interview that examiner and, and talk to him over the phone. <clears throat> Most patent examiners, I think, are allotted about, I think last I saw it was 24 minutes to read the patent application, which they don't, uh, look at the claims, which kind of specify what you're trying to protect prevent others from making, using, or selling, draft up their office action, and send it out. So they've never seen, you know, they're, they're supposed to be trained in the technology, but they're trying to get up to speed, look for prior art, write up this document in 24 minutes. None of them ever read the, the patent application. What they do is they look at the claims, they do a keyword search, uh, and then draft it up, and draft up their response, and then send it out. And they wait for the applicant to, to call them back and educate them in a later document. So you can only educate somebody so much with you know, another written document, especially when they're probably just going to skim through it and do another keyword search. So what you always want to do after an examination is arrange for an examiner interview. I had one case, uh, I'm sorry, I had one client. They had 19 patent applications. 17 of them were with the same examiner. So I did not want to piss off this examiner. <laughs> but I did want to educate him about the technology. And, you know, I'm not going to bribe them or buy them, you know, tickets to Niner games or anything. But you know, you, you want to get to know him, you know, have a, you know, establish a friendly discourse and and you know, just get him to work with you rather than against you. Um, the, for this particular patent examiner, every time I received an office action, even when I was about to file a new patent application, I would call him and let him know. And I got to know him really well over a year and a half. I got to know his girlfriend's name, his family name. I knew two. I knew he was going to propose to his girlfriend two weeks before he told her. Uh, he knew my kids' names. He told me he, he said, yeah, I guess I'm going to get married. I think she's the one. I don't really want kids, but that's just what people in my family do, so I guess we'll have kids. I mean, he shared all kinds of things with me. Um, and so <clears throat> what that developed was you know, a, a, a good relationship I had with him. And so if he had a patent that, you know, of mine, and he saw, well, this, I don't think these claims are patentable, but I think if he tweaked it here or there or included something else from the spec, this might be. So he would call me and say, listen, these claims aren't going to work, but if you do something like this, I think it'll fly on our side here at the patent office. 
you know, that comes from having that relationship. So you know, there's rules for patents, uh, there's rules for patentability, but everything is implemented by people. Many things are implemented by people. So I mean, you don't want to bribe or do anything unethical, but just you know, establishing a relationship with anyone at the patent office is just going to help you. And then you always want to have a plan. Um, you never just want to take you know, shots in the dark. Hey, we have something. Let's just you know, file a patent. You want to have a plan. You know, is it something that you really want to prevent? You really want to spend the resources to sue someone against? Or is this just you, know, you want to have a portfolio just to kind of be able to fight back and cross license if somebody comes after you? Um, patent litigation has become, been called the, uh, the game of kings, a typical patent lawsuit can sometimes end if it's you know, uh, settled early, can end in maybe only 500K or 800K, but most of them cost, you know, when all said and done, between three, three million and six million dollars. And that's just the attorney fees. That's not you know, what the damages are if you lose. Um, so planning now to avoid litigation with a defensive patent or you know, you know, which, client, you know, which potential <clears throat> uh, competitors or products you might really be willing to go to the mat for you know, that's something you really want to have in, in mind ahead of time. And then types of intellectual property. You know, we're, we're talking about patents, but there's also trademarks, uh, copyrights, and trade secrets for a technology that may not be suitable for a patent. And then you also want to know, you know what's your budget, you know, how much you're going to spend uh, you know, annually, how much time do you want to ask you know, your, your team to be engaged and work with a patent attorney or your in-house counsel or whatever, um, and just company awareness. You, know, you want to make sure that you know, your, your engineers, your engineering supervisors, you know, directors, everybody knows what the plan is. Uh, most companies have a, uh, like an incentive program. I have another talk I do just on incentive programs. If anyone's interested, uh, let me know. I'm happy to provide you with the slides. So anyways, you want to have a plan uh, before you, you, know, you, you, you start spending money on, on a lot of this information. And as I mentioned, public disclosures. So in the United States, if you disclose something, um, uh, if you disclose an innovation to the public, and a disclosure can be putting it on a website, offering it for sale to a customer, uh, doing a talk in, about the details of the technology, uh, that triggers a 12-month period in which you, you can still file a patent application, but after that 12 months, it's considered donated to public domain. Um, in foreign countries, if something's made public, it's public domain immediately. So you just, it's a best practice, if possible, to at least get some sort of protection online if it's something you might want to protect before you make that disclosure. And then open source. Uh, anyone who has a team of software engineers knows that you're probably using open source in some, in some way, in, in some place. Uh, <clears throat> I have another presentation I do just because this is a very complicated, detailed subject regarding uh, implementing an open source program, program in conjunction with patents. But the, the gist of it is, uh, you know, if, you put, if you're using open source code in, code in your software, some of these licenses can uh, prevent you from doing any patents. Not only if it's in that, uh, that you know, some component or system itself, but also if it's networking with, with other components or other systems. So you really gotta be careful what type of open source software you're using and where you're using it. Uh, so you just definitely want to have a plan for keeping everybody educated, keeping track of where the software is and what the license requires. And then doing things right the first time. Um, once you file a patent application, you can't add any new content to it. So that's why it's particularly important to include that wish list. You know, if you have your core invention. It's, it's, it's a really good idea just to, is there anything else we could add to this? Even if we're not going to implement it, you know, anything else that the, cl the customer would like or anything else that the team wished they could have done or that a competitor might add to it. You know, if you can add those things to your patent application, it could be much uh, more valuable and you're not going to be able to add them later once you file it. So it's important to do that uh, at the time of filing. And then put in the time and money resources to do it properly. I get a lot of calls for a new business and I'd say half of the calls I get are someone that tried to do it themselves or went with you know, 1-800-PATENTS or something like that, and they're not happy with what was done, and they want to know if I can fix it. And the answer, unfortunately, is usually no. Um, you know, if that initial information, you know, all the technical detail isn't in the application when you file it, you, know, you need to file a new patent application. And if the contents are even made public, uh, and if that 12 months has passed, then there's just nothing you can do. So that was about the it.
Okay. Well, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to take cards if you uh, want to maybe <clears throat> ask me some questions offline. I have cards up here. And then I also uh, have more information on open source and trade secret and foreign app filing that I can email you if you're interested. Uh, thank you again very much. I appreciate it and have a good rest of your conference.